the fuck? Hello, mortals. <laughs> that sounds like that the uh, Motorola ringtone. <laughs> Let's try again. Welcome, mortals. What a delight you joined me on this accursed night. No need to prowl the foggy street, for I prepared for you a treat. But first, a riddle, a little test. Who differs when they're laid to rest, with rocks upon its final bed and sleeps face down, split from its head? The answer you'll find isn't clear. If you're intrigued, please stay right here. If when we're done, you're still alive, would you please comment, like, and subscribe? Do you mind if I break character? Welcome to my den. My name is Ira, or Vampira, and I make video essays about different topics while painting something. So today, as a Halloween treat for me, <laughs> we're gonna talk about a topic that I am really fascinated about, and I hope that you will find interesting as well, and that is the topic of funerary archaeology, and more specifically, deviant burials. And to add even more of a Halloween touch, we're gonna talk about vampire burials. So hopefully you're just as excited as me, and without any further ado, let's paint a Halloween essay. Most people have heard of cases of witch trials, where women who were feared by or simply different from their social environment were persecuted and executed, often publicly. Learning about witch trials now, we understand that these women were likely regular human beings. I say likely, you know, to keep an open mind, but there certainly is no evidence to suggest that they were anything but regular human beings. Well, witches weren't the only form of supernatural that was feared in the past, nor is it the only supernatural wrongfully applied to, fatally so, to other otherwise regular people. Today we will be talking about the concept of deviant burials, the burial archaeology of fear and necrophobia, and we will explore these fascinating subjects by focusing on the creature many children fear of, teenagers lust over, and adults poke fun at, vampires. Funerary or mortuary archaeology is a branch of studies that focuses on burials, from burial positions and the composition of the buried to the grave goods, grave structure, and more. Funerary archaeology seeks to study the norms and traditions of death within a specific culture. This contributes to the studying of any culture by adding another dimension of social structure and in many cases of spiritual belief. When studying a burial site or a broad burial tradition, it would be important to focus on the following. Is there a difference between the burial of a peasant and the burial of a ruler? Are are there differences between different genders, ages, and professions? Is there a communal, designated, organized place for burials, or are the dead buried near their home individually? What rituals, if any, can be evidenced to by the remains, etc.? Studying the dead gives us a lot of information about the living, their beliefs, traditions, and social norms. Deviant burials, if so, are burials that are different from the norm of a given society. It should be said that the distinction between normal and deviant burials depends on interpretation. So, to characterize a burial as deviant, the context has to be considered. It needs to have characteristics that are very different to the majority when they both belong to the same time period, geography, and social group. For example, infant and child burials could be vastly different from adult burials of the same site and period, meaning that even if a child burial is different when compared to a typical adult burial, to classify it as deviant, it has to be different also to the majority of child burials. While a burial that is deviant from one context could very well be typical or at least not uncommon in another, some considered some types of burials paradigmatically deviant, such as prone burials, which are when the body is turned face down, decapitated remains, remains covered with stones, remain with amputated limbs, remains that appear to be buried alive, multiple cramped shallow grave burials, and those with trepent skulls. While these burials are relatively uncommon, it is important to mention that in some contexts they still might not be classified as deviant. Another important point is that deviant burials may also be the burials of saints, or of heroes and other individuals who are honored by their community in death. These cases are not relevant to today's topic, but they are important to at least mention for context. 
One aspect that is indicative of a deviant burial is that many of them are secondary burials. Now, primary burials are basically when the dead are buried close to their date of death and their remains are left where they were originally buried, and for the most part, undisturbed. I say for the most part because robbing an item from a burial wouldn't make it secondary, but robbing a bone, say, and burying that bone somewhere else would mean that that bone was given a secondary burial. A secondary burial, then, is when remains are manipulated in any way after they have been buried, but remains don't have to already be buried once to qualify for a secondary burial. Practices of leaving the remains to dry after the death in an exposed place, taking them from that place to a final resting place, are a common form of secondary burials. At times, but not always, the remains would be manipulated before they are placed in their secondary burial. For example, the calculithic burials, which often would entail leaving the remains exposed for a long period of time, then taking the exposed skeleton and rearranging it or discarding some of the bones to finally place the selected remains inside an ossuary, which is placed in a burial cave or a chamber. If you're interested in calculithic burials specifically, I actually wrote a paper about that and it will be linked in the description below. In some cultures, royal be traditionally not given a primary burial, so the secondary burial by itself is not an indication for a deviant burial, but many deviant burials are also secondary. So now that we went over the technical terms, let's move on to the lore behind vampire burials. The interpretation of certain deviant burials as vampire burials, or anti-vampire treatments, are often based on readings and studying of folklore and the attempts to match aspects of a specific burial to descriptions found in folklore texts and sources. Analyzing the common European folklore regarding vampires, David Baraclau, who is a historian and archaeologist at the University of Cambridge, writes, Belief in vampirism was connected with pagan spiritualism and spread after the introduction of Christianity in the 10th and 11th centuries, which introduced inhumation in places of cremation for dead bodies. Slavic folk beliefs held that those most likely to become a vampire were drunkards, thieves, and murderers, as were those that died by drowning and through suicide, along with the the unbaptized and witches. These vampires, Vapir, were believed to be the manifestation of an unclean spirit possessing a decomposing body. Folk traditions varied regionally, but generally held that vampires left their graves at night to suck the blood of the living, after which they returned to their cemeteries. A variant of this tradition holds that after their death appearing completely normal, they would arrive at a town and live amongst the people, often even marrying and fathering children. But at night they would become dangerous and wander the countryside in search of blood, perceived as the essence of life and hunting the living. In both traditions, vampires survived nocturnally by drinking the blood of human victims and were accused of pressing on people in their sleep, causing diseases, particularly epidemics of plague and even the death of people and livestock. Vampire superstition became widespread in England until the 12th century when it was replaced by witchcraft superstition, and in Eastern Europe in the early 18th century, causing people to be accused of vampirism and for anti-vampire treatments to be applied to corpses and burials. Some researchers suggest that the fear of the undead and the subsequent post-mortem treatments against them have been present since the Neolithic, specifically in the Balkans. The most common treatment to prevent a recently deceased individual from developing vampirism according According to folklore was driving a stake through the corpse's heart, burying the body upside down in a prone position, burning the body, laying a heavy pile of stones on top of the body, and modifying the body by dismemberment, tooth extractions, or decapitation. In the last case, the head would typically be buried away from the rest of the body or placed between the body's feet or legs. As you probably noticed, all of these practices would be considered deviant burials in most contexts, which lead to many archaeologists, especially in the 70s, to be quick to label many deviant burials as vampire burials. In her article, Cultural Aspects of Vampirism in Eurasia and the Rite of the Secondary Burial, Carla Karadi Muzi, a professor of philology in the University of Bologna and an expert on Eurasian texts and folklore, explains the prevalence of secondary burials in the lore of anti-vampire burial treatments. She explains that Slavic, Finno-Ugric, and Altaic folklore shared the belief that two souls exist in the human body and should ideally both escape the body when it dies. However, in some cases, the 
second soul remains trapped in a body as it decays, either living in the heart chamber or the cranium. But the second soul, or shadowed soul in some sources, is vulnerable to being infected by spirits which are called traveling spirits or irregular spirits, an infection which will bring the body back to life. It is the responsibility of the religious body of the community for the most part to either identify a body where the second soul remains and to preemptively prevent it from becoming infected by stabbing the body in the heart or cranium to allow the second soul to escape, or to take care of bodies which have already become infected to protect the community from them. The infected body would have to endure a secondary death, and only when the religious authority is certain that they have indeed died, they would get a secondary burial. Graves that display some deviant elements suggest to practices conditioned by necrophobia, the fear that the buried will return from the dead to terrorize the living. As mentioned, necrophobic treatments would be described in folklore, and at times, texts would be found which describe the treatment and the circumstances under which they are performed. Burials, which match this description from various texts, would be considered as vampire burials or, more accurately, secondary burials with necrophobic elements. One brilliant example is the report of a Polish grave excavated in the late 50s. In 1957, Polish archaeologist Bonifacij Zielonka published his record from excavating several burial sites in central Poland. One of the graves in Adolfin shows the remains of a man whose head had been decapitated and placed between his legs. He describes a textual account called Casus Distrigis, which described an event from 1674, where a local community was under attack from a man who rose from the grave and began hunting for human blood. To protect the community, the local priest said the grave must be reopened and the body flipped over to a prone position. However, this didn't help, so the grave was reopened again and the head was cut off. The grave Jelonka excavated isn't the one described in the textual record, but since the burial elements were similar if not identical, it was worth considering the burial as a necrophobic burial. So is this science or sensationalism? Deviant burials began being treated as a separate funerary group in the 1970s, and in those years the interpretation of deviant burials as anti-vampire practices was the dominant academic narrative. Today, deviants are rarely interpreted as vampire burials, and in the cases that they are, it is mostly considered to be sensationalized media interpretation. Most sites that were previously believed to be vampire burial sites have been revised and other interpretations were suggested, such as burial sites for outlaws and criminals, and individual cases of deviant burials are also given other interpretations. However, given the strong superstition regarding vampirism, especially in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries, it is likely that anti-vampire or necrophobic treatments were practiced to some extent and that some individuals were even executed due to them being suspected to be vampires. I do agree though that labeling any deviant burial as a vampire burial in the past was due to sensationalism and to some extent academic laziness. And I appreciate that other possibilities have since being pursued because I believe it leads to a better understanding of the underlying reason for past society's superstitions. If so, what are the reasons for deviant burials? Deviant burials can largely be considered to belong to three categories, post-mortem punishments or acts of humiliation against the deceased, and acts of superstition. The third category is an act of honor, as we briefly discussed in the beginning of the video. So deviant burials as punishments and humiliations. The discovery of prone infant burials, as well as adult prone burials in old Christian communities, it had been suggested that this type of burial was a punishment for people who have not been accepted by the Christian community, or conversely, those who have not accepted Christianity. For example, the prone infants were suggested to not have been baptized prior to their deaths, so burying them face down might have been a punishment for them and their families for not converting to the church, or to mark the buried as not belonging to the rest of the community. Post-mortem mutilation or dismemberment are also considered an act of punishment in various periods. Many deviant burials where the remains are found inarticulate are interpreted as cases of religious persecution or punishments for acts against the community. Whether this act was stealing or harming others, or unacceptable marriages and life choices that went against society. Deviant burials as superstition. In other cases, such as with burials of so-called vampires and other supernaturals, deviant burials are a superstitious precaution to protect the living, either from disease or from the haunting of a harmful supernatural entity or the evil eye. It is hypothesized that deviant burials are strongly connected to illnesses and physical abnormalities such as pathologies, epidemic infections, disabilities, mental illnesses, and so on. 
on. This is likely to psychological and medical misunderstandings of the times, for example, the lack of knowledge about bacteria or the nature of how some diseases were spread, led to the belief that illnesses were spiritual in nature, or the misunderstanding of physical abnormalities as indicators of the supernatural or a sign of bad luck. According to a scientific paper from 2007, pathologies that could have been connected to suspicion of vampirism specifically are tuberculosis, porphyria, rabies and photophobia, photosensitivity and mental disorders. Another superstitious reason for a deviant burial might be the manner of death. For example, those who died a violent death or were killed were believed to hold a grudge against their killer as well as the living community who failed to avenge them. In essence, deviant burials likely indicate those who have been socially excluded or ostracized for many reasons. Some might have been criminals, some had medical conditions that weren't understood, some might have belonged to a racial minority, some might have been prosecuted for their sexuality or for choosing to marry outside of the norm. Some could have simply not been liked for whatever reason and accused of something supernatural just to be disposed of. To think of the horrors some had to endure in their final moments of life simply for not fitting in or for being seen as threatening for no reason for being different and misunderstood, and to think of their resting grounds and remains violated or tempered with for superstitious reasons is quite horrible. So while the existence of witches and vampires is highly debatable, the existence of social phobias and the hatred of the other is very much real and also not eradicated from today's world. And that, in my opinion, is more terrifying than most Halloween tales. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I really hope that you found the topic interesting. Funerary archaeology was actually my topic of my focus topic, my topic of interest <laughs> during my bachelor's degree. And I absolutely love doing the research for this video. So I hope that you found it interesting and that you enjoyed it as well. And I also hope that you liked the painting process of this piece. What the fuck you smiling for? Some of you may recognize the reference as Viago from what we do in the shadows. Uh, I absolutely love Taika Waititi and I don't think I did him justice. It doesn't really look like him, but I like the painting nonetheless. It's a good funny, creepy painting. <laughs> Thank you once again for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, please let me know what you think about this topic. Did you find it interesting? What in particular intrigued you? If there are any fellow archaeology student or funerary anthropology students, if you are interested in vampire folklore and you want to add something that I missed, if you just want to comment something nice for engagement, I definitely invite you to do that because it really helps us out. And by us, I mean creepy hand and eye. Like this video if you enjoyed it, dislike the video if you didn't enjoy it, consider subscribing to my channel if you enjoyed this type of content, stay safe, stay spooky, and I'll see you next time.